Many of us have faced the dragon, paralyzed by the jaws of despair, imprisoned in the clutches of depression. The dragon, he steals our joy, our peace, our sleep. He ravages our relationships and our enjoyment of life. For some, it's seasonal. For others, it's occasional. For others, it's chronic and constant. But the dark oppression of the dragon doesn't have to remain. We can be set free. We can overcome. We can be victorious. So raise your sword and rally the war cry because it's time. It's time to defeat the dragon of depression and despair. Amen. Are we ready? Yes? All right. Well, hey, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church and to part two of our series called Defeating the Dragon of Depression and Despair. And in this uh, series so far, we have learned, first of all, we talked about biblical principle number one, which was to be proactive and not reactive. And, and in being proactive, we talked about the importance of getting our inner self moving in the right direction. We talked about the role of our heart, of our mind, of our thought life, and how important that is to us being victors and not victims in life, learning to overcome and defeat not only depression, but many of the trials and struggles that we go through in life. We learned that medical science has proven that between 87 and 95% of our illnesses, both physical as well as mental, are directly connected to what goes on in our mind, our thoughts, okay? So it is vitally important, we learned last week, that we not worry about trying to change all these external factors. There will be some that we can change and some that we cannot. But what we can change is what goes on on the inside of us. So we learned last week that we need to surrender. Surrender our heart to the rule of Jesus. Surrender our minds to the rule of Jesus so that his truth is what is uh, the authority in our life and what rules and reigns in our lives so that everything we go through and everything we experience, every thought and every feeling we have goes through the filter of God's word. Does, is it right? Is it wrong? Does it measure up to what God says is true or not? And the Bible teaches us not to let just any thought enter our head and run around in there and then build a fortress, okay? But that we are to filter every thought, take it captive, arrest it, okay? And grab it by the throat, and if it does not measure up to what God says, then we kick it out. We make it obedient to Christ. We don't let it stay there because stinking thinking will ruin your life. Amen? It'll make you sick. Literally and in every other way, it, re it, it produces destruction. Now, this week, we're moving forward. We're going to move from the inside to the outside. What, what can we change on the outside? It still is you. What we can change, we can't change other people, but we can change ourselves with the help of God. So we change our heart by giving it to Jesus and he makes us a new person. We can change our thinking by taking captive every thought and making our brains think in line with God's truth. And we need to change something else and that is our words, okay? Our mouth. We're gonna talk about the role and the importance of our mouth today because it does matter what we say and what comes out of it. We need more laughter. We need to be uh, praying more, praising God more, and we need to be speaking positive confessions over our life, speaking God's truth, God's promises over our life instead of all the negativity and all the criticism that's out there in our world today. Have you noticed that tragedy sells? Have you noticed that negativity sells? Just go pick up a newspaper or a magazine. It's always about who uh, was unfaithful to who, uh, what car accident, how many people were killed. You know, I mean, it's all this negative stuff. So we not only need to change our thinking, though, we need to change what's coming out of our mouth. And there's a reason for this, because the next biblical principle we're going to address today, biblical principle number two is this, that the words we use become the life we live. And I took that particular quote from Bear Grylls in his book, A Survival Guide to Life, but it, it's actually a biblical principle. Okay, that the words that we speak are like building materials. And so when we say words, they go out from our mouth and they start to build and construct the life that we're going to live tomorrow and the next week and the next month and the next year and so on. Or think of it in these terms. 
The Bible refers to our words sometimes like seeds, okay? And so our words go out like seeds. And what we're planting today with our mouth, with the words we're speaking, is what's going to grow and be harvested tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, in the next 10 years, okay? So it's very important that you and I really take to heart what is coming out of our mouth, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us as well. Because, you know, when you speak negatively, negativity and you speak critically and you always are, uh, you may be harsh or, or you're always fault finding, guess what happens? You can actually plant those seeds of depression and despair in the hearts and minds of people around you, not just yourself. Or maybe you don't feel like you struggle with depression, but you speak negatively and critically. And you know what that does is it plants bad seed in the hearts and in the minds and in the lives of the people around you. I can't tell you how many young person I have worked with who has grown up in a home where they were always criticized. Their parents were always finding fault with what they did or how they did it. And sometimes it's not their parents, sometimes it's aunts and uncles. I know that, again, my wife who has struggled with depression uh, lifelong, one of the things that really attacked her self-image was how her family would speak about her sometimes. And sometimes it was that she was maybe being bratty or didn't measure up to her cousin. Or maybe it was that there was, you know, her hair was out of place or she might have a pimple. I mean, you know, we can grow up in those kinds of criticals and critical environment. And while that was not the reason that she struggled suffered with depression, understand that it contributed to that, right? It frames the world that we grow up in. And then we struggle. We struggle with depression. We struggle with self-image. We struggle with all these negative issues in life. So it's very important that we are careful about the words we speak, not only for ourselves but for the people around us. In fact, our mouth, according to God's word, has great power. Let's look at it. Proverbs 18 says, a man can fill his stomach with what he says. The words from his lips can satisfy him. Stop there a second. What's that saying? It is saying that your mouth will produce a harvest and that what you say you will eat. Okay? It's your words are going to produce something tangible that you can eat, that you will consume in life. So it's very important that you think about what you're saying and how you're saying it. It goes on to say in verse 21 how powerful these words are. It says, your tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love to talk will eat the fruit of their words. Again, notice your words have fruit. They produce something. And notice specifically what they produce is life or death. So I want to ask you today, what are you speaking over your life and over the lives of those who are around you? Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? Are you speaking life about your marriage or death? Are you speaking life about your children or death? Are you speaking life about your education? Are you speaking life about your finances? Are you speaking life about your health, about your mental well-being? I, I hear people say all the time how, oh, I'm just stupid, or I can't do that, right? Are you speaking life, or are you speaking death? Never let your kids say, oh, I can't do that. I can't do math. I can't do this. No, it might be more difficult, but you can do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. So it does matter what comes out of our mouth. In fact, our mouth not only speaks life and death, but it is our mouth, our words, that is our key weapon in spiritual warfare. You see, you and I are in a spiritual battle. We're not just contending against flesh and blood. Oh, that person said this bad thing about me, or this person tried to hurt me, or my finances are, are, are difficult. You know, the, the economy's bad, so I'm struggling against that. No, 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 no. There are other forces at work, forces of evil that are at work in our world that are trying to overcome and destroy our lives. That is the devil and demons. And do you know how we are to engage in spiritual warfare? I'll tell you right now, it's not in sign language. It's not by lighting a candle. Oh, I'll light a candle to get the demons to go away. No. It's not by throwing holy water somewhere. No. You want to know how the Bible instructs us to engage in spiritual warfare? With our mouth. 
Think about this for a second. Jesus and all of his followers, not just immediate followers, but all throughout history, when they rebuke demons and cast them out of people, how do they do it? They speak and they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of that person, right? That's how he cast out demons. When the devil came knocking on Jesus' door to tempt him to try to quit on the mission that he was here for to save us, And he came and he tempted Jesus. How did Jesus overcome those temptations? He spoke. And it's important not only that he spoke, but what he spoke. He said, it is written. So while Satan was speaking into Jesus' life, trying to tempt him, trying to feed him lies and get him to believe things that are false, that would lead him down the wrong path, Jesus held tightly to the word of God, and he chose to speak God's truth over his life and his situation. And as a result, Jesus overcame all of Satan's attempts to attack him and to throw him off course and to destroy the mission that he was here for. Jesus overcame every temptation that way by speaking the word of God. This is how you and I engage in spiritual warfare. So our words are very important. Not only are the words we speak important, but the attitude and the spirit in which we say them is also important. Are we speaking with an attitude and a spirit of faith or of fear? Are we speaking an attitude that is love and peace or harsh and critical and judgmental? Are we speaking with an attitude of confidence in God or question and doubt? Are our words full of thanksgiving and gratitude, cheer, and joy? You see, it does matter not only what we say, but how we say it. Because notice in Proverbs 17, it says, A cheerful heart is good medicine. And again, Nehemiah 8 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Friends, I want you to know something here today that we are meant to be a people of joy. We are meant to be a people of cheer. When's the last time we really enjoyed ourselves? When's the last time that we laughed? I mean, seriously, really laughed and we're happy. I want you to know that medical science has already proven or I say already, really, they came along and affirmed, they found through medical science what God had already told us thousands and thousands of years ago, which is cheer and joy. Laughter is healing. It is a medically proven fact that the more you laugh, the more your body releases those healing agents, speeds up your healing process, right? and makes you of a sounder mind. Laughter is of great importance, but unfortunately, the world in general, and even God's people, those of us that follow Jesus, you would have thought we all got pumped out of a pickle factory. We're so sour. Right? We're just so negative about everything. Nothing's ever good enough. There's always something wrong, something that doesn't measure up. Something that that makes us feel down or angry or sad or hurt, right? Always. And we tend to focus on those things. Well, listen, not only do we need to guard our mind and the thoughts that we allow to run around in there, but we need to guard our mouth to make sure that the words that are coming out of our mouth are not only the right words, but in the right attitude or spirit, that we're speaking life, not death. It does matter what we say. The words we speak become the life that we live. That's why in Philippians chapter 2.14, write that down, Philippians 2.14, God commands us to do everything without complaining and arguing. How many times are we complaining and grumbling and whining about what we can't do, what we don't have, You know, God wants us to give praise and thanksgiving. He wants us to focus on what we can do and what we do have. Do you know, so many people miss out on the blessings of life because they're all focused on what they don't got or what they can't do, and they miss what's right in front of them. And they don't enjoy life. They're miserable. So do everything without complaining and arguing. Now, to illustrate the importance and the power of our words... 
we're going to look at the story of the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was arguably the greatest Christian ever, second really only to Jesus himself. The Apostle Paul, a lot of people might refer to him as the super Christian because the Apostle Paul was at one time an enemy of Jesus. He not only did not believe in Jesus, but he wanted to kill and persecute those that did believe in Jesus. And one day he had this undeniable God experience that radically changed his life forever, and he became a ze zealous follower of Jesus. He preached to more people and went more places than any other uh, of his early church peers, any of the other apostles and leaders. He, re he planted more churches. He saw more miracles. He seemed to pray more. I mean, he just, he did it all. Cast out demons, raised the dead. I mean, God used this man to write half of the new, nearly half of our New Testament. So this guy, I mean, really, he was the bomb. He's like the, a Christian's Christian, right? The super Christian. But you know what? Paul was a human being. He was a man who faced his own struggles in life. And in fact, at one point in his life and ministry, he was so overwhelmed by his troubles that he wanted to die. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In his own words, listen to what Paul says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. Stop there a second. Look up here, please, because I need to tell you something of vital importance. Paul just shared a very, very important biblical truth to finding freedom in life, and most of us just missed it. We read right over it. Did you notice he said, we do not want you to be uninformed about our troubles? In America, especially, in our day and our age that we live in, we tend to live a very fear-based life. We tend to be concerned about how other people will think about us and perceive us. And so more times than not, we're actually doing the opposite of Paul. We want people to stay uninformed. We really don't want people to know what we're battling and struggling with. We don't want them to know our problems and how broken or messed up our life really is because of why we're ashamed. We feel afraid that people will think less of us or look down on us. And I want you to know something right now that makes you and keeps you a prisoner to your problems. Because as long as you're hiding them, you're not able to fix them. There's no fixing it in the dark. Bring that stuff out into the light. And there are two reasons why. Notice what Paul says. He said he wanted them to know that we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Did you see it? Paul says, you need to know that what we were going through, it was beyond us to be able to handle it. In fact, it was so overwhelming and there was so much pressure that we felt like just dying. It would be easier if we just died, if we were dead, right? Have you ever been there? Sure, some of us have. We felt like life would be better for those around us if we weren't here. We felt like this is just too hard. We can't take it anymore. I've heard people say, I'm tired of being life's punching bag or the devil's punching bag. I just wish I could just give up and die. That's where the apostle Paul found himself overwhelmed by life's circumstances. And notice he wanted them to know about it. Why? Well, because he needed their help. He needed them to be praying for him. And many times in the Bible, we see Paul asking people to pray for him and what he was going through. He also needed them to learn from his own trials and see God at work. Where Paul could do nothing, God was able to still work and do amazing things. And so notice what he said. He said, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So this is a learning lesson here, he says. 
He says, first of all, I'm in this place where I would have liked to have just died. Things were so hard and so terrible. But then he goes on to say this. But this happened so that we could see God at work. So we could learn that it's not in ourself that we need to trust and rely upon. It's in God. Because this world is bigger than us, isn't it? Yes, we don't control anything and we don't control other people. So we're not going to be able to fix this broken world. In fact, it is a broken world that is beyond our repair, beyond our control. So we will get our feelings hurt. There will be things that don't go the way we want them to. And there will be hard things to go through, painful things. And you know what? That is life here on earth. And that was true of the Apostle Paul. And it's going to be true of you and me. But unfortunately, in our day and age, we struggle with feeling guilty, like because we're struggling with our problems, because our problems are overwhelming us, because we feel at a place of despair and hopelessness that somehow we're spiritually immature or unspiritual altogether. We feel guilty, don't we? We feel sometimes like we're being a bad witness to the people who don't know Jesus. Or we're being a bad example of a Christian to our fellow Christians who do know Jesus. Or we struggle with feeling like maybe we're just unusable by God because of our problems and the fact that they're overwhelming us the way they are. But I want to ask you, was the Apostle Paul a bad witness? Was he a bad example of a Christian? Was he unspiritual or immature? Was, did he disqualify himself and make himself unusable by God because he found himself in a place of such despair that he would have rather died? Where his circumstances were so overwhelming that he just couldn't take it anymore. Have we ever been in this place of despair and hopelessness? Ourself, where life would be better, it would be easier to make the darkness go away if we could just die, if we could just leave this world. It's not worth living anymore. So here's the Apostle Paul, the super Christian, living in this pit of darkness and despair, wishing that he could die, but then having a change of heart, a change of mind. But he said that, his circumstances were overwhelming him. But what was it that he was going through that brought him to this place of hopelessness, this place of despair? Notice 2 Corinthians 11. He elaborates and tells us what was going on in his life. He said, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. So he received 39 strikes from the whip, okay? Five different times. And then three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That's a pretty long list of some serious circumstances, isn't it? And we may be tempted to say, well, oh, that Apostle Paul, uh, he had reason to be depressed or in despair, right? Wanting to die. But you know, the fact is, is that those were the Apostle Paul's circumstances. And while ours are not exactly like his, while we don't have the exact experience, we have the spirit of what he was going through happening in our own lives. Think about it. Why do you go without food? Because there's lack. Are we struggling and facing lack in our life? Sure. Why do we, where, where's the hardship between those that are his fellow uh, Jews and those that are, his, are Gentiles? Are there people that are at odds against us? Are there people that are putting pressure on our life and making our life hard to live with? 
Maybe we have a marriage that's not living up to our expectations or worse. Maybe it's very, very stressful and tense. Maybe our children are kind of not listening. They're not obedient. They're going off the deep end and getting in trouble, not doing well in school. Or maybe it's not that at all. Maybe there's some, some uh, struggle within the family, a, a uh, sickness or a disease that one of our loved ones is having to deal with, and it's causing great concern and stress in our life. There are lots of trials that we go through. Maybe it's our finances. We're having a very difficult time managing what we have and making ends meet, right? We go through all kinds of difficulties in life, and you know what? They can overwhelm us. And we're all wired differently, and so we go through these hardships, and we start to feel overcome. We start to feel down and depressed, and sometimes even like the Apostle Paul in a place of despair where we just despair life itself it'd be easier to just die and go to be with jesus right and what was a, the apostle paul's response in all of this you know being the super christian that he is certainly he must have like you know waved his hand or something to make it go away well we know that's not true we know his first response is that he despaired life he said man i just wish i could die but his next response is just like you and me too. You want to know what he did? He asked God to take all his problems away. Oh yeah, let's look. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Take it away, Jesus. I'm tired of this trial and this trouble. I'm sick and tired of people beating up on me, life beating up on me. Just take away the trouble. Isn't that what we do? God, make it go away. Right? But you know what? God never promised that he would take away all of our troubles and hardships and trials of life. He couldn't make that promise because you and I live in a broken world full of broken people. And so guess what? We're going to deal with a lot of situations with people and circumstances that are messed up and painful, okay? And we can't change those. We can't make them all go away. There are some things that will, but there are many things that won't. You know, anyone who struggles with depression, this day is gonna be a tough day. Why? It's gray. Can we pray that the weather front will move and we'll have some blue sunshiny days? Well, sh sure, we could do that. But you know what? If these clouds roll out, new ones will roll in. It's going to happen. So while we cannot change everything externally, what we can do is work on what's on the inside. We can change us with the help of Jesus. And friends, I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul, he did what you and I would do. First, we get full of despair and we wish we could just die. But we know we can't just die. So the next best thing is God take it all away. Make that go away. God take that person and just send her to the other side of the planet. Check, check, check. There we go. All right. So notice here that Paul asked God to take it all away. But God said, notice verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So notice what the Apostle Paul said. He had a heart and a mind change about his situation. God said, listen, I'm not going to take away every trial and every problem that you face and go through. But here's what I will do. I will be with you. My power 
is at work in you and through you for your good, okay? Notice he said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And the Apostle Paul got this and he understood that in life when we are working so hard, if we can fix it, then we're going to get the credit that we're strong enough and we're tough enough to duke it out and win that fight. But when we can't fix it, when we come to the end of ourselves and we just don't have anything left, we've got nothing more to give and we want to quit. We want to give up. We want to die. But we know we've got to press on. Then when we move forward, when that issue gets addressed and we overcome, people will look and say, you know, uh, Mike's good, but he's not that good. Something else was at work in his life. And we're able to say that something is Jesus. When I came to the end of me and I could go no further, God kicks in and continues to carry me on far beyond where I could ever go on my own strength. Okay? When I am weak, then I am strong. I delight in those weaknesses so that God can be glorified because when I can't do it and it happens, we know that God did do it, all right? How many of us pray that God will take away our problems? We need to learn to delight in our weaknesses and in our trials and in our uh, hardships and persecutions and difficulties. Now, I do want to make one thing clear. A side note, notice in your outlines, we delight in our weakness, not for our weakness. There's a huge difference between praising God in the circumstance of having cancer or losing a loved one. There's a big difference between that and praising God for cancer or for losing that loved one, right? Listen, we don't praise God that we're, we've got cancer or that our baby has cancer. We don't praise God that our loved one got killed in a drunk driving accident. No, that's foolishness. Some people have taken God's word and tried to twist it and, and make it say something. Well, you know, everything that happens is the will of God. And, and so we have to learn to just thank God for everything and learn what he has for us to learn in that circumstance. Listen, is there something we can learn? Is there some blessing in that moment? Sure there is, because God has promised us that he can take even that which is meant for evil and use it for good. So yes, every circumstance that you and I go through, good and evil, can be given to the Lord, faced God's way, and out of it can come a blessing, for sure. But does that mean that everything that happened was God's will? Absolutely not. The Bible tells us that on many occasions, His will was for somebody to do something, and they didn't do it. And on many occasions, it was God's will that someone would not do something, and they did do it. Time and time again, we see that God's will is violated over and over and over again. There are many crises and hardship that we go through in life because of the freedom that we have to be free moral agents, to have the freedom of choice. And we hurt ourselves and we hurt people around us all the time. We live in a broken world because of it. And that's not God's will. God's will is that we do things his way. So notice we delight in our circumstances, not for them. I can praise God when all hell is breaking loose around me because he is faithful, he is good, and he will be there for me and he'll see me through. I don't praise God because all hell break, is breaking loose around me. Does that make sense? So let's not turn this into something that it's not. Again, the important thing, we're talking about the role of our mouth here, the words we speak become the life that we live. So the Apostle Paul had a heart and mind change. How did that affect then his mouth and, and how he faced his situations? Well, let's look at an example where Paul learned the power of prayer and praise and joy and positive confession. In Acts chapter 16, we find that the Apostle Paul was on mission he was going around, he was preaching and teaching Jesus and starting churches, and in one town, he ticked off some people, some business folks, and they were angry because of the trouble he was stirring up in their community, so they grab them and they take them before the magistrates. And then notice in, in verse 22, it says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. 
Now, after they had been severely flogged, now notice that. They didn't just have their robe ripped off of them and they got a couple whacks. No, it says they were severely beaten. Their flesh was bruised and ripped open and oftentimes bone exposed. And here they are, humiliated and in great pain publicly. And then notice that the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So, receiving these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, this inner cell, it's quite interesting. You know, here's Paul and Silas. They're already beaten up and in great pain. And now they're told to be put in jail and guarded carefully. So the jailer took his orders very seriously. He was afraid of what would happen if he didn't follow them strictly. So he threw them in the inner cell. Now, the inner cell was this pit in the center of the prison. It had typically one door to get in and out of. And they were thrown into this pit and there was, it was darkness. Very rarely did these inner cells have any kind of window or lighting. And so if there was even a window, it was small and very little natural light got in. So here they are stuck in this pit. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, this pit was a place where they had stocks. And so Paul, was that, Paul and Silas both had their feet put in these stocks so they couldn't even move. So now they're stuck sitting on this pit dirt floor, a floor where other people had sat for days and days and months and weeks, and they were sitting there, so you can't move. So what has to happen when you got to go to the bathroom? So this floor of dirt and human excrement and urine, rats running around, here they are sitting, broken, busted open, bruised, in great pain, in these uh, shackles, and, and not able to move. Sitting in this dark, dank pit that stinks, is full of human excrement. It's nastiness, filthy. And notice this. At about midnight, and oftentimes in, not, in Scripture, that is not just telling you what time it was in the night, but oftentimes it also points out that this is the darkest hour, okay? At midnight, the darkest hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Notice that they were praying and singing praises to God. They weren't whining and complaining and grumbling. God, I am sick and tired of this. All I do is spend my life to help people. All I do is serve you. And what do I get? I get beat up. I get thrown in prison. I'm hungry all the time. No, no complaining, no grumbling. They're singing praises to God. They're praying. And notice what happens. They're, and notice that they're doing this so loudly that all the other prisoners are listening. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, do not harm yourself. We are all here. Friends, Paul learned that the words we speak, that what comes out of our mouth becomes the life we live. So in this scripture... In Paul's experience, there are three takeaways. Number one, we see this, that in spite of Paul's broken body and dark circumstances and being, you know, chained up in this pit, notice that Paul focused on the greatness of Christ and not the greatness of his circumstances. And as a result, that enabled him to number two, Paul chose to pray and praise God instead of complain. And because he chose to pray and praise God instead of complain, and because he chose to speak life over his situation instead of death, that leads to number three, which is that the power of God was released through prayer and praise, producing freedom. The chains fell off, not just them, but the people around them as well. Friends, they spoke life and freedom, and that's what they found, not only for themselves, but for the people around them as well. What is coming out of our mouth? It does matter. We don't have to stay in the pit. We don't have to stay shackled and chained up 
to our problems and living in darkness anymore. If we will learn to guard our thoughts, guard our mouth, think right, speak right about our circumstances and release the power and the promises and the presence of God into our situations, guess what? Things can change. Captives can be set free. The chains can fall off and the doors can open. Amen? Praise is of huge importance. In fact, notice in your outlines that praising God puts your problems into perspective and changes how you feel. When you choose to praise God like the Apostle Paul did, you begin to focus on the fact that your God is bigger and greater, stronger and smarter than anything you may face and go through. Oh, your problem might be this big. Or your problem might be this big. It might be as big as this building, which is way bigger than any of us. But God is bigger. Amen? He can deal with it. He can handle it. And he will if we will draw near to him. But when you and I grumble and complain, we're speaking death. We're releasing death into that circumstance. We're making the problem bigger instead of smaller. So speak life, speak God's truth and God's promises. Learn to praise God in whatever it is that you're facing and going through. Learn to give thanks. What will we do? How will you and I respond to this today? Will we pray more? Will we go to God and give to him those things that are stressing us out and causing us problems? Will we praise? Will we learn to focus on and find the good things in life? and express verbally our gratitude to God for it? Will we say, God, thank you for what I do have and what I can do, instead of complaining about what I don't have and what I can't do? Will I speak positive things, positive confessions and words over my life and over the lives of the people around me? Will I speak God's promises and God's truth? Will I speak life? Will I speak the language of victory? Or will I speak the language of defeat? Will I speak death? What am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? What's going to come out of my mouth? What about laughter? Am I going to laugh more? Am I going to hang around people that encourage me and, and build me up and make me laugh? Where we tell funny stories and we talk about things, you know, I share, my kids know a lot about my childhood growing up and all the stupid things I did because I want them, of course, to learn from my mistakes and hopefully avoid them in their own lives. But secondly, because we just sit and laugh at how stupid I was. Okay, uh, Dad, I cannot believe you did that. What were you thinking? I wasn't. Right. And so we laugh. You know, and there's lots of good, clean humor out there that we can watch on TV and movies. And I know we are all going, well, I, I, I've never heard of any. Well, let me share with you a very quick example of this. Check out this video. I love doing comedy. I was doing a show at uh, Hermosa Beach at the Comedy Magic Club, right? So, I, so I, leave, I leave and I'm walking to my car and it's getting a little cold, a little dark outside. So I'm thinking, let me hurry up to get to where I need to be. So I start jogging. And this white lady with a little jogging outfit on came around the corner about 20 feet in front of me. We jogging in the same direction now. <laughs> then she looked back. <laughs> she started jogging faster. So I looked back too. I didn't see anything back there. <laughs> if a white person is scared of it, Michael Jr. is scared of it too. <laughs> so I started jogging faster. After she looked back again, she took off in full stride. This time I didn't even look back. I also kicked in the gears. I could have easily passed her up. I'm thinking, no, I can't just lead this defenseless lady out here by herself. <laughs> Whoever back there is going to get her. <laughs> so I yelled up to her, is that as fast as you can run? I got to run too on Michael Jr. Do you feel the power of 
the he that healing power of laughter? Do you feel the joy that it brings, the freedom, peace? God meant for us to laugh. God meant for us to enjoy life. And you know, there is good, clean humor out there that can inspire that in us. And uh, you know, I just wanna encourage you, take time to laugh. Take time to spend time and hang out with people that are gonna make you laugh and watch some movies that are gonna make you laugh because it is healing to the body, okay? Now, very quickly, as we wrap up, I wanna share with you, after everything that Paul's been through, he gives, us, gives some instruction to the church at Philippi. He says, here's what I want you to learn to do, okay? He said, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Friends, joy is, such, is supposed to be such a significant part of our life that he tells us to rejoice two times, not just once. He said, rejoice, learn to walk in that joy of the Lord. Learn to praise God and be thankful for what you have and to enjoy the blessings that God's brought into your life in spite of the difficulties that you may be facing or going through. On top of that, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Friends, we need to be a people that are gentle and that are kind. I'll be honest, I struggle with this one myself. I am a pretty direct and sometimes abrasive person. I've had to learn to be careful about what I say and how I say it. But I do need to tell some of us in this room today that if we are a negative person who is critical and fault-finding, okay, we, we're absent the joy, shut your mouth. You wonder why you've got no friends. You're harsh, you're critical, you're negative, you're fault-finding. And that is not fun to be around. Let's go back, forget what God says, let's just go back to what Grandma always said. If you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all, <laughs> right? I mean, listen, we want friends. We want people to like us. Well, then be like a bull. And when you're negative and critical and finding fault all the time, that ain't fun for anyone, including you. So be quiet if you can't say something nice. And also, if you find yourself being harsh instead of gentle, okay, speaking, trying to correct people and speak the truth into their life, but you're coming across abrasive and unkind and hurtful, listen, you may be trying to help, but you're hurting. You're making things worse instead of better, okay? The fact is, is that what you are trying to say may be true. They may need that instruction or that correction, but listen, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And if they don't feel like you care about them, if they just feel like you're grabbing the knife trying to stab them for all the wrong things they've done or how they don't measure up to you and your standards, guess what? Not gonna have very many friends. It's gonna be a lonely world for you, okay? So learn to rejoice. Not criticize, whine, and complain, and fault find. Learn to be gentle, not harsh and abrasive, okay? Verse six, he goes on to say, do not be anxious about anything. Don't get stressed out about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what are we supposed to do with our mouth when we are facing circumstances that are overwhelming, bigger than us, and stressing us out? We're not to stress or get afraid. We're to speak. What? Not complaining, not grumbling, but prayer and praise, thanksgiving, right? And when we do that, notice the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? The peace of God. That's what we want, peace. But wait a second. I've done that. I've prayed. I've praised God. And the peace came and the peace went. What happened? Well, there's... If you stop right there, you'll miss a very important and fundamental principle that enables you to walk in that peace. If you stop there, you're gonna be robbed of your joy in life over and over and over again. You're gonna become disappointed with God even. 
Because you're going to pray and you're going to praise and peace will come and peace will go. What is that fundamental principle? It goes back to what we talked about last week. Look, he says, finally, brothers, after you've been saying the right things, rejoicing and praying and praising and the peace of God comes, notice he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Listen, you can say all the right words. You can make all the right confessions. You can pray and you can praise God. And then if you allow your head to start that stinking thinking again, guess what's going to happen? I don't care if you said, Lord, that person hurt me and, and they made me feel bad about myself. And, and I know that I need to forgive them. So I'm going to forgive them, Lord. And I'm going to pray that you'd meet them, that you'd bless them, that you'd heal them and that you would heal me. And I just want to thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love and your goodness. I believe wholeheartedly that this is mine. Amen. All oh, that peace of peace. And I can't, I cannot believe they said that. I cannot believe they did that. Oh, that's it. They get me the gun. I'm going to get, what happened? What happened is that we prayed, we gave it to Jesus, and then we took it back because we started the stinking thinking. We got to think on these things. So guard our mind always, the thought life, and then we need to guard our words because the words that we use become the life we live. What would our life look like, friends, if we prayed every day? What would our life look like if we learned to praise God in every circumstance, no matter what we're going through? What would our life look like if we were speaking good things over our life and over those people's lives who live around us? And what would our life look like if we laughed more? I'll tell you what it would look like. Happier and a lot more friends, right? We'd be happier, we'd be healthier, and people would want to be around us. Amen? The words we speak become the life we live. What's your next step, friends? There's a space for you to write it down. I don't know what your next step is. What does God want to do in your life today? Maybe for the very first time, you feel God tugging on your heart saying, you know what? You've been doing life your own way long enough. You've been following everybody else's plan. It's time to do life God's way. And maybe for the very first time, you feel God tugging on your heart, pulling on your heart, saying, come and follow me, do life my way, and get my results. And if that's you, in a moment, we're going to start by saying a simple prayer. That's it. Start that journey by saying a simple prayer. But for some of us, we have prayed, we believe in Jesus, but guess what? We haven't been guarding our mind or our mouth, and so through stinking thinking, we have drifted. We've embraced ungodly attitudes, ungodly words, and ungodly behaviors, and we find ourselves, while we believe in God, we, see, we feel very distant from God, and, and while we believe in God and all of his promises, they are not a reality in our life right now. Right now, we live a very defeated life. We feel very much like a victim and overcome by our circumstances, and maybe today, God is stirring in your heart that it's time to change. It's time to repent. It's time to get back on track, following Jesus, doing life God's way, thinking right, speaking right, and behaving right, and a number of the other things that we're going to address in this series so that you can be the victor and not the victim, Victim, right? And if that's you and you need to make that recommitment, then we're going to pray. But before that, some of us, we're doing just fine. We believe the right things. We're doing the right things. Our journey with Jesus is going well. But today, God's speaking to us that maybe we need to work on something. Maybe we need to work on, on being more positive and saying good things instead of being critical or negative or, or uh, judgmental or fault-finding. Maybe we need to learn to start speaking Praising God and being thankful for what we do have. Taking time every day to praise God. Taking time every day to pray. Maybe we need to write down the confessions of, of the promises of God and confess those over our life every day. Maybe we need to stand in front of that mirror and say, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you and what they think about you. What matters is that God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever so that you could believe in him and and not perish but have eternal life that God has made you more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus that greater is he that's in you than he who is in the world that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you that by his wounds I have been healed amen I mean maybe some of us got to 
Get, do the hard work, find those promises, and write them down and speak them over our life every day. I don't know. Maybe some of us just need to learn to be a bit more gentler and a bit kinder in how we say things. I don't know what God is speaking into your heart today, but whatever it is, I want you to write it down. Write it down so you don't forget it. Write it down so you can take it away from here today. You can pray about it. You can make sure that you apply it into your life and that you do it and share it with others so that they can hold you accountable. Amen? But if God is calling you to make a commitment for the first time or a recommitment, I want you to pray a simple prayer with the rest of our church family. So let's close our eyes, focus our attention on Jesus, and say this prayer with the rest of our church family. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. I confess that I've done my own thing. I've thought my own thoughts, spoke my own words, and did my own thing. And I've hurt myself, and I've hurt others. And I was wrong. Please forgive me. Today I ask Jesus to be the king of my life. I want you to rule in my thoughts, in my words, and in my deeds. I want to do life your way and get your results. Now help me, God, to fulfill this vow, to faithfully follow you, and to never stray, and to never fall away. In Jesus' name, amen.